Not that long ago, the most complex thing in your car was probably the radio. And yes, it's true, I date from a time when a radio was an optional upgrade in your car and most lower trim vehicles came without any means of audio reproduction other than your beautiful singing voice. Or the horn. But until the mid 80s, the engine control unit or ECU was a pretty simple object. Something that could maybe tweak the things to control for temperature or fuel quality, that basically did a bit of advanced retard on the timing. Something that could more or less still have been replaced by a spinning lump of metal and some electrical contacts. As time's gone on, electric vehicle or not, cars have become increasingly dependent on a wide array of processors and sensors to control everything from the anti-lock brakes to the aircon, and even as chips have become even cheaper and more reliable and more flexible than switches, we've moved to controlling windows and turn signals with them. Things that would seem to need no such level of complexity. Someone recently said to me that they didn't trust an EV because it was full of electronics, and expressed their concern that the electronics in an EV would be the cause of its untimely demise, a comment that notwithstanding the fact that gas cars are similarly afflicted with a surfeit of gadgetry these days, is a valid concern. So will all these chips kill cars? But first… We interrupt this broadcast with the following short message from me on my day off. So it turns out that some of the people who didn't like the singing were incredibly rude. So they emailed Nikki on her personal account, they even got Nikki's phone number and messaged her, they left multiple obnoxious comments, most of which we've deleted from the uh, ch on the channel, and so we've decided it's not worth the time. I'm sorry to those of you who really loved the singing, but you know, like, subscribe, do what you're gonna do. Bye bye. Computers have been around for a bit, and while there are still some pretty old computers out there doing useful service, so some might say that this concern over computers dying is overrated. Oh, and when I say older, for once I'm not talking about the BBC Micros in the Science Museum staying in service so long they literally wore the magnetic coatings off the disks in their floppy drives. Although, those too. But when you think of vehicle-based computers that are doing a pretty stellar job of outlasting their expected lifespan, the Voyager probes pop to mind pretty quickly. Launched back in 1977 and predating even me, although not by much, the probes sported a then state-of-the-art set of three dual redundancy computer systems that worked together to enable the probes to journey to Jupiter and beyond. And when I say state-of-the-art, I don't mean overclocked and pushed to be as fast as possible. Instead they were designed and built to run slow and cool, heavily shielded from radiation, loved and petted and generally very much mollycoddled. That's because it's actually kinda difficult to get Chuck from Bymore to pop around and fix the computer when it's in interstellar space, about 14 and a half billion miles from Earth. Or to put it another way, at the time of making this video, nearly a full light day's worth of travel away. And outer space can also be kinda chilly, and also kinda hot at times. Massive shifts in temperature, lots of radiation exposure, all the kinds of things that electronic components really don't like very much. Computers in cars aren't subject to quite the same strenuous high reliability screening of integrated circuits and semiconductor devices as those space mission destined computers. While reliability is prized, at least for the warranty period, anything that happens after that is more of a crapshoot. And whether components that fail can be replaced with original parts, that's mostly down to the manufacturer. In some countries in Europe there is legislation in place that requires manufacturers to keep spares available for cars for somewhere between 7 to 10 years. But even in some other European countries, despite notional harmonisation of those laws, there's not still any actual requirement or there's a shorter requirement. Similarly in the US, while it's typical for manufacturers to keep most common spares available for around 10 years, there's no actual legal requirement, although many people believe that there is. To be sure, there are moments when safety requirements will overcome manufacturers' reluctance to replace expensive parts. For example, NHTSA, the National Highways Traffic Safety Agency, required Tesla to issue a recall and replace 
a media control unit with a design flaw that caused premature failure of the touchscreen on earlier Model S sedans. Now, in that case, an electronic component, the eMMC, which is a chip that fundamentally acts like a combination of a tiny little SD card of the sort we're all so fond of losing, and a controller for that card, that component was used in a way in which it really shouldn't have been used. The storage on those cards isn't designed to be written to and read frequently, and was also, in this case, not big enough. The MCU wrote logs to that card. A lot of logs. So it wore out much sooner than would be expected, and NHTSA told Tesla that it would have to replace the screens in all 134,951 cars. Tesla argued that you could still use the car more or less fine without the screen, but in this case the agency disagreed. So clearly there is some degree of protection, at least for a while, for things that are required for safety or basic functions. And Tesla, like every automaker, could spend a whole lot more on making the computer systems in cars more reliable and more long-lasting by doing just what NASA did and does – derate a vehicle's onboard computer systems, forcing them to work at a fraction of their theoretical maximum speed. Which in itself would make the systems more reliable. That, however, would also likely increase the cost of your car significantly, or make the systems in it much less feature-rich, and slower to respond. If the last decade or two of consumerism has taught us anything, it's that people and companies would much rather save a few thousand dollars today and then replace the broken hardware in five years time, rather than, say, spending a bit more now and building something that would last 40 years in the first place. So design flaws and cheaper components aren't the only cause of problems in high-performance chips and systems that are increasingly finding themselves used in cars. When you buy a PC or a Mac, those computers usually have chunky heatsinks and plenty of fans. That's because computers and their modern ancillaries generate a fair bit of heat, particularly when they're working hard. So those fans shift a moderate amount of air across the heatsinks attached to processors, graphics chips, and power supply components. That's why at least yearly we all strip down our computers and clean out the fans, check and replace the dust filters if we've got them fitted, and are sure to use an air canister to blow dust out of the heatsinks. Wait. Uh, I'm hearing that we don't all do that. But we should. Obviously, this is harder or even impossible for some units that are sealed against maintenance, and that's one of the reasons that modern computers often only last 8-10 to 10 years. They're pushing the components harder, they're running hotter, and few people take the time to clean them out. So they slowly boil themselves like a metaphorical frog in a pan. Now, another important part of this equation is that between the chips and the heatsinks is a substance called thermal paste. That's there because the surface of the components and the surface of the heatsink has tiny imperfections, and those tiny imperfections make it harder to transfer heat from the device to the heatsink which is trying to dispose of the heat. There are different formulations for that thermal paste, and anyone who's taken apart an old computer will know that some pastes last a very long time, and some cheaper pastes don't. Those cheaper pastes can crack, they dry out, and they stop providing that very important connection between the heatsink and the thing that's being cooled. When that happens, the chip can overheat. Cleverer systems will slow down the chip when it starts getting hot to avoid overheating and crashing. Less clever designs will just fail. And if that chip is used in a car, you might start getting laggy or inconsistent performance from whatever system it's in. It might record a fault and stick on the all-important something's wrong warning light, or it might just stop working altogether. In a car, this is often even more of a problem because as a general rule, electronic components in cars don't get the benefit of fans to cool them. That's because folks don't like high-pitched whiny objects in cars. Uh, other than children. Well, mm. that and fans. Fans clog up with dust and dirt pretty quickly, and the environment inside cars is rarely super dust-free. Most places have their own specific class of cruft that collects in vehicles. For those living in the Midwest, it might be dry, dusty, or sandy soil. Now here, the inside of the car is just gradually filled with pine needles and ants. None of those are terribly conducive to the functioning of fans. So those electronic systems and subsystems mainly have to contend with just passive cooling, although in many EVs, the high power systems are also cooled by dedicated coolant loops. Losing the fan solves the noise issue, but makes the dust even more of an issue. 
And there are a couple of other challenges that computers in cars have to contend with that aren't typical for your home PC. The first is obviously vibration. Vibration isn't generally good for electronics and components subject to a lot of vibration can break their solder joints. Then there's the weather. The inside of a car can reach temperatures well above ambient temperatures, since they are effectively greenhouses on wheels. If the exterior temperature gets up to 100 Fahrenheit, that's about 38 centigrade for those of us who like science, the interior of a car can reach up to around 170 Fahrenheit, that's 77 Celsius. And that happens in fairly short order. It's not a temperature that's likely to prolong the life of your in-car electronics. Then there's the winter, where cars are often left outside and can get to temperatures well below freezing. In both those temperatures, it's likely that we'll get in and rapidly hit the climate control, or more likely in an EV, precondition the car to get cool or heat before we get into the human unfriendly temperature box. That will inflict cycles of rapid temperature changes, and the different thermal expansion of those components and the boards they're mounted on can cause tiny micro fractures that eventually break the connections between components and the circuits they're part of. Add to that, in areas which get, well, weather, the interior of a car is alternately dry or wet and humid, a really great way to get corrosion on connectors and components. Okay, so it's all bad news. Computers in cars are just destined to die. They'll fill with dust and overheat, or components will get vibed off, or the components and connections will corrode and stop connecting. And we're all at the mercy of the god Robigus, and we should probably go back to having a specific holiday and maybe sacrifice an NVIDIA GeForce RTX 3090 just to appease him. Well, no, not really. It's not all that bleak. Because sure, components, electronics and otherwise will reach the end of their lifespan, and they'll need to be replaced. Well, unless they're torsion bars on a Morris Minor. But just as in the gasoline world, where aftermarket replacements exist for manufacturer control units, there are even open source projects like Rus EFI. I'm pretty certain that we're going to see aftermarket solutions to fix what we eventually discover are failure modes on the components in EVs. As we discover what bits of electronics wear out, we'll have people building solutions to keep these cars on the road longer, before the vehicles wend their way back to being recycled into more cars, or whatever our better solution for transportation is in the future. Of course, whether our politicians will choose to legislate against repair and modification, that's a question you good folks get to push and vote for. With right to repair, we're likely to see more solutions that keep vehicles viable longer. If more and worse laws come in that extend digital rights management and IP protections, we'll probably struggle to keep vehicles going. But whether manufacturers decide or are forced to make parts, and whether modifications are encouraged or made harder, people will come up with solutions. So while it's unlikely that our cars will make it to Sirius Tau, a repairable future is one that we can all share and enjoy. That's it for today. Thank you for watching, and we'll be back soon with more! If you liked the video, be sure to give it a thumbs up, and don't forget to leave your thoughts below or in our free to join Discord chat room. There's a link in the video description. If you want a more generalised news roundup in the world of cleaner, greener, safer, and smarter vehicles, check out our news roundup show every weekend. And don't forget we produce videos every single day on this network for you to enjoy, ranging from deep dives and features to tutorials, unboxings, and reviews. If you haven't already, make sure you've subscribed to this channel and our other channel Transport Evolve Take 2, and give the bell a gentle ring to make sure you're told when our next video goes live. Thanks on behalf of the entire TE crew, go out to the folks on my right for being our $15 to $49 a month supporters. Special thanks to our $50 a month patrons, Chris Maxwell, Pedro Mura Pinheiro, Patrick Boyarski, Bennett Elder, Brian Newton, David Kitchen, Michael Goad, Ricky Leong, Andrew Martin, Guido Drahota, Brophy Wolf, Tezza in the Gong, Gordon C, Stephen O'Donoghue, Kyle Hodgson, Anthony Coates, Regine Fellows, Rory Litwin, Jim Burness, Chris Asenta, Chris and Michael Johnson, Peter Dillinger, and Denny Hyde. And our deepest gratitude to our $100 a month Patreon supporters, Anonymous Freak, Marcel Ward, Reggie Watts, Joe Bresney, Reed R, JP Fagerback, Russ, John Lyons, Will Graylin, Matthew Drobnak, Christopher Lee Jones, Andrew Glenn, Paul Conway, Laura Reynolds, Ellery Hensley, and of course, Ian. 
Want to be part of the amazing list? You can join Patreon at the link below, hit the join button below to support us on YouTube, or show us your support through Bitcoin, Kofi, or our cool swag store. Links are down there. And if you're unable to support us financially, just know that watching a video and sharing it makes a real difference to our ad revenue and keeping the algorithm Keeping the algorithm well fed on things other than human souls. Thanks for joining me, and as always, keep evolving! <laughs>